Mark, thanks so much for sitting and talking with me today. Yeah. Uh, I get, was lucky enough to get an early copy of Batman versus Robin number four. I've been reading this series. Uh, obviously, you've been laying the groundwork for where this has been going since you started doing World's Finest. Uh, can I just say, before I finally let you talk, uh, it's great to see you back at DC and doing, moving and shaking big events, big, big, important stuff happening. You know, you're really, you're really building, building something up here. It's really exciting. I will let you say that all day long. No, thank you. <laughs> very nice of you to say it. it. It feels very much like I'm home and I'm having some of the best and most exciting years of, of my creative life at this moment. I'm so glad to hear it. Uh, the other question I have to ask is, it's a very simple name, but I, I've been saying it, I'm sure, <laughs> wrong the whole time. Every single, every single, I say Neza. Neza, that's okay. I've been saying Neza too, but yeah. Yeah, it's kind of dealer's choice, but yes. Cool. All right, great, great. Uh, so when you created or introduced Neza into the DC Pantheon, I was, honestly, I was like, oh, you know, it'd be fun to kind of like back, you know, flashback one-off villain and then boom, shows right back up in the present right. in Batman versus Robin. Uh, his machinations, his father, uh, his connection with uh, the Lazarus Island and all the stuff that happened from the Robin series. It's really nice to see it all connect and all like it, it feels like a cohesive universe of all things. Man, go um, figure. Right, exactly. Um, when did you come up with the idea for this like Batman versus Robin idea? Because it's a very like it's a sexy hook. You know, it's like oh, Batman versus Robin. You know, you oh, I would never right. imagine such a thing <laughs> unless it's Damien involved. No, the hook was a couple. The hook was a couple of years old at that point. It was one of the first things I pitched when DC invited me back home, and it sat there for a while because it didn't have an anchor. It didn't have a, a real good reason for existing. Mm. But with World's Finest, as you'll as you've seen, and what you'll continue to see is that I'm trying to build every arc of that book, even though it's set in the past, into something where there are repercussions in that story that feed out into the modern DC universe. And Nezo was the first to go that way. So started building that. And then I had two fortuitous things happen. One was that Josh Williamson was working with Lazarus Island and talking about his, the back run of his Robin. I think I, I, ta I taught him about halfway through his Robin run. And we started talking about how that could tie in to what's going on. Uh, Nezo was never intended to be trapped on Lazarus Island until halfway through World's Finest number five scripting, at which point <laughs> it made more sense. And it saw, it saw, we saw it get all feed together. Also, Gene Yang uh, was coming at this bit of mythology it, from a completely different angle, completely independent of me, just purely by coincidence. And it was only after we started talking and I got Gene's seal of approval on, on this stuff that we realized we should be working together on this. We're, you know, we're, we're both dealing with similar, with the same characters or at least tangentially connected. Let's, let's see what we can do to, to bring them further together. Sure. I, I love seeing, especially in this issue, but in this series in particular, you're not just taking original creations and pitting them against the DC universe, but you're playing with stuff that is cemented in fans' minds like Robin 666 and like the Dr. Fate helm and its, yeah. its, its implementation. Uh, you know, just, just the incorporation of Damien in his history is, is really fun to see, like kind of put to bear. Cause we've seen Batman kind of pitted against his son in different various ways, but this is the first time that magic has kind of been at the fulcrum of it. Right, right. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't know if you're a purist like me, but I, I'm like, man, Batman has such a problem with magic, you know, like a fundamental issue with it. And it's he, so fun to yeah. see him like react that to was, that. That was really, that was the heart of Batman versus Robin all along. Because I really, I love fish out of water stories. I love putting Batman in situations that he is completely incapable of, of controlling. Yeah. And magic is the final frontier as far as that goes, because he's a control freak. Right. And magic requires you to surrender to a force higher than you, a power higher than you. And for all of Bruce's skills, he cannot do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's actually uh, that's, that's one of the lines in the very issue. It's, it's, he doesn't submit. He, can, and, uh, he simply yeah. cannot submit or else he wouldn't be Batman. Yeah. Uh, I love the uh, the use of because I think we can release this like when the issue is out, so we can yeah. we can talk a little bit about spoilers. But uh, the Doctor Fate helmet 
and yeah. Batman using it and it kind of growing the ears and doing all yeah. that like pure fan service but also kind of dope to see because Batman is you know it's 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 an earned moment because it's Batman like desperately trying to save his right. son and, and and battle this force that he can't possibly comprehend or defeat and uh how much fun did, was that for you where you're like <laughs> like at what point were you like no, I'm gonna put the Dr. Fate helmet on him I, I it was I was already into the story but I was I always looking for the big visuals you've never seen before there we and go. I love, love, love taking the toys in the DC toy box and handing them to characters that don't normally have them. Speaking of which, how much fun are you having working with powerhouses like Mahmoud Asrar and Dan Mora over at World's Finest? Oh my God, they're they're both just astounding. I, you know, I felt I felt kind of bad for Mahmoud because I don't think he realized when he took the job that <laughs> he was not being asked to draw a superhero comic as much as a horror comic. Sure. But but he man, he pulled out all the stops and yeah, 38 pages an issue gave him a lot of elbow room to play. And yeah. it looks moody and dark and grim, but in a way that is not typical in a Batman comic. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a Batman comic, and that was the intent. Gotcha. Uh, and with Dan, you know, Dan just takes everything and makes it look modern. Uh, yeah. and that's where we make a good team because you know, I love the established toys, but I am the first to admit that some of this stuff needs a little bit of sprucing up. Mm. You know, does Aqualad really need to be wearing shorts? That that right. kind of thing. <laughs> um, I'm the and I'm you know I'm I'm in no way a stickler. What'll happen is I'll send him reference on something like a Phantom Zone projector and say, "Dude, do whatever you want to with this." And nine times out of ten, he'll just send it back, and it'll look right and exactly the way I want it to look. But somehow he's made it look modern. And yeah. that is a gift. That is a gift, not just f to him, but for the book itself. Yeah, it's been great. Uh, I, I guess we could talk a little bit more about Lazarus before we transition to Ward's finest. Yeah. But um, what can you say about, because I think we're, we're coming to the end of Batman versus Robin after right. this. Like this is, this is the penultimate issue. Yeah. Um, Without giving too much away, what can you tease about the the namesake and the direction for Lazarus Planet? Because it's as you as you know, uh, this is one of the only like teases that DC has given about like the grand plan, the big year long. Right. Here's the thing: the first thing on the list is Lazarus Planet. That's so I'm right. sure, and and there's very little, you know, to say about what Lazarus Planet is. Although I'm sure, you know, with with with, with people like you working on it, like there's breadcrumbs throughout this series through world's finest that will probably would telegraph it if you were to read it a year ago you know oh yeah i could see exactly what ladders of planet was going to be but what can you tease about it it's it's the perfect kickoff to 2023 for dc because crossover events at all companies sometimes can be reductive sometimes can be subtractive sometimes can be about setting rules or establishing new boundaries for characters. And we wanted to do exactly the opposite. And having the Lazarus volcano explode, have magic all over the earth, coruscating in every corner of the globe with an idea that it can do anything. It, it, it's magic, anything can happen. Gave us a chance to elevate some B characters, gave us a chance to create some new characters, gave us a chance to lay some groundwork for some forthcoming books like Shazam, and all with an eye towards as someone who has been both the architect of a event and the poor guy who has to write chapter four, <laughs> the, trying to give the writers as much flexibility as humanly possible. So I think handing them a situation by which, okay, anything can happen is about as flexible as I can make it. Yeah, I, I think that's that's pretty much an open canvas. All I had was a name originally. Right, I'm just right. like, oh, Lazarus Planet. Okay, well, is it like part of New Genesis? Are we going into the so? It's right. like, oh no, Earth is the Lazarus Planet. Yeah. Like that's yeah. that's really fun. Uh, I also love seeing you implement magic into the DC universe in a big bad way. That's kind of like maybe even setting some actual like ground rules because 
compared to other universes, DC seems to have a lot of like explanations and tethers that explain like really what magic is. And, and right. you know, it, it's, it's harder to have like the avatar. Who is the, who is our magic person? You know, right. you, know you typically you say Dr. Fate, but like, let's be honest, his biggest appearance was being on Batman's head in this right. issue. Exactly. Recently, you know, <laughs> so I think, I think the default ends up being Zatanna somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, there is a cost to magic. There is a price that is paid with magic. And, and I think that's something that we're hitting very hard in Lazarus Planet is we see the magicians struggling to get their powers back. I mean, when we mm. got, when we open Lazarus Planet, we've got, you know, Shazam and we've got uh, Zatanna and very few other magical characters able to retain any sort of magic. The rest of them are simply powerless. So right. having to take their powers back, having to get their powers back is not just a matter of flipping a switch. It is a matter of there is a price to be paid. Yeah. Well, that's really exciting. Uh, switching gears just a little bit about World's Finest. Um, mm -hmm. Man, what a great series that has been. Thank you. And uh, I love how every issue you're like, okay, well, I haven't had a chance to really talk about Doom Patrol, so I'm going to put Doom Patrol in here. Here we go. Yeah. And yeah. it's so great to see them. And uh, is that one of your kind of like, Obviously, at this point, you don't need to say like, hey, I think I'd be really good for this team book or whatever. <laughs> but are you basically going like, all right, so obviously, you know, I can handle Superman and I can handle Batman. But like, look at what I would do with Doom Patrol. Look at what I would do it's, with the Challenge of the Unknown. Look at what I would do with all these other characters. Like, I guess. I mean, it's not so much an audition as it is the, the idea that I've been thinking about these characters for much longer than most of the audience has been alive. Yeah. And I feel like I may have something unique or some new take or some different take on some of these characters than you've seen before. Sure. And that's why I like bringing them to the fore. Uh, Metamorpho shows up in our next arc and I'm having a ball because I have a point of view on Metamorpho that people don't normally take. People think of him as just a character who can just change in any element whatsoever he wants to. And that's not Metamorpho's power. Right. Metamorpho's power is his, his, the elements in his body were scrambled. He's still, he's not made of plutonium now. He's just, it's <laughs> the same elements that are normally in the human body and being able to manipulate them in a different right. way. But if he, because if he could become in any, any element, then every metamorpho story is two pages long because he becomes plutonium and he wins. We've set up Neza and, uh, and his implications of the future. Is World's Finest eventually going to transition to the present day or are you having too much fun in the past? I've had too much fun in the past, but yeah. we but we are making a point and and deliberately so to, like to connect them to connect though each arc of the world's finest to something modern in the DC universe, something contemporary in the DC universe, because I think that's the way to make sure that the book quote unquote counts and yeah. isn't something that people can just say, Oh, I don't have to read that. I'm reading the main DC universe. Well, no, there's stuff here that feeds into what you're what you're seeing in the in the modern day DC universe, right, right. Um, seeing you back at DC, obviously, there's a desire to see you tackle the Man of Steel again uh, in a, in a big bad way. But one of my questions that I'm kind of more curious about because I feel like you world's finest, you're doing it. You know, yeah. Not maybe he's got to share the screen a little bit, but you get to talk. You, you get I'm to getting, look. I'm getting to write the Superman I want to write. Yes, you get to write the Superman you want to write. They got this new thing called Black Label. You have any, yeah, you have any desire to play with the Black Label line? Brian Hitch and I have been, and we've announced this some time ago, we've been cooking up a three-issue Black Label Superman project for a couple of years now. It is... Am I, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, you, missed that. you missed that. It is, you know, it's been in development for a long, long time. And it is mostly because I am besieged by a lot of DC monthly work, which is nice, right. that I've... I'm still, I still owe him a script, but once I've turned in that script, we can, we can start moving that toward publication. Uh, and it's, yeah, 348 pagers. Uh, it is essentially, in a way, a sequel to Superman Birthright oh. without, well, this is, not, without tethering it, like without, without being like, no, this is, exactly. like, nothing else much, happened. It's, it's just very this. much, it's very much the, the vision of those characters and in the Superman universe and Luther and all those characters is consistent with what we set up in Birthright. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, is there anything else that you are hyped about that we can't necessarily like pin down that's connected to Batman versus Robin, World's Finest, or any other uh, of the projects you're working on now that you're like, oh man, like this is just a just just a grab bag right now. You're having well, a, you're having a ball. I, am. I mean, Shazam is a bucket list item. Has always been a bucket list item, and. Yeah having Dan Moore on that while retaining him on world's finest because he is a machine. Yeah. Is, is so delightful. He, by his own admission, he doesn't know much about that world. He doesn't know much about Shazam and that, and that mythos and it's fun educating him and it's fun <laughs> just having a ball with that book tonally. It's a lot like what we were doing in impulse back in the day. Yeah. Which is that, yeah, it's a superhero book, but it is, also a comedy with some dramatic elements yeah yeah some of the fun of 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 those books of the day were an excuse to kind of like flip the convention a little bit and be like yeah it's about like yeah it's about this but actually i really want to talk about these characters and and, yeah yeah. and, you know what it's like to be to be a human being um uh how much input do you have on some of the iconography that we see in world's finest because I want to say that like, you know, we're seeing some of the most be- because of the nature of Dan Moore's art, mm-hmm. not to disparage uh, Azra no, no. doing a phenomenal job sure. with, uh, with, 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 with Batman versus Robin. But um, we're seeing some, like, I think people are going to be having like the, the visions from world's finest, the depictions of Superman, Batman and Robin and Supergirl mm-hmm. are some of the most iconic yep. in recent years. Uh, I guess I'm speaking specifically to the pants. Are you, were you the one who said, give Robin some pants? Or was no, that, uh... he, that was a surprise to me, but I, you know, I was delighted by the way it looked. I mean, what Dan has been able to do is take things from 30, 40, 50 years ago and make them look completely modern without compromising the look. Yeah. Uh, and every time I give him something like that to play with, I tell him, feel free to do whatever you want to with it to make it look modern. So I give him, you know, Boy Thunder's costume, which I stole from an old issue of World's Finest. And I said, do it really, just, you, just think of in those terms. And right. what I get back is that costume, exactly. But it looks <laughs> modern somehow. It looks great and, and stylish. So he's just the gift that keeps on giving, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say that both of you are at this point, we're getting some really dope books. Uh, I'm really excited to see where Lazarus Planet is heading. So, uh, <laughs> Surprise. Uh, uh, yes, I, uh, I was, I was lucky enough to get an advanced look at uh, the end of the most recent or the upcoming issue of mm-hmm. uh, world's finest and the implications of boy thunder, which you, again, we talked about you kind of telegraphing where we're yeah. going with this and I didn't see it coming. And actually, you had to see my reaction <laughs> as it was happening. Right. But no, uh, no one saw it coming, no matter how many times I scream from the rooftops. Boy Thunder grows up to be a character that you know. Yeah. An established and, character that you know. And no one seems to have pulled that name out of the ether. And I couldn't be happier. No. And I am so excited to talk about it with the audience when we cover this book. But yeah. also just to see freaking Magog, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've had in my hip pocket for 25 years. Yes. Oh my God. Now, yeah, have you have you wanted to tell like the yes. origins of MAGA? Real? That's yes. been your I've plan? Had that, I've had that in my pocket since the end of Kingdom Come. The story oh of God. Superman's heretofore unknown like impl- sidekick and what, right. he, what comes up, what what comes of him. And all of that was sitting in a file for 25 years. Oh my God. That's awesome, man. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I did not see that coming. I was just kind of enjoying Boy Thunder and seeing where he was coming from, and you know the the origins are really like they're they're exciting and interesting that he comes from this alternate Earth and it's mm-hmm. Gotham and man, <laughs> I, clues, I did not the clues see are all there. The but yeah, no, it's there. I'm I, like it's all locking into place. Like all those yeah. moments are filling in as I'm going, and I'm like, oh my god, yep, Magog. Now, okay, so. <laughs> I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants in this case, but when it comes to the implications of Magog and his origins and introducing like who he was and where he is, mm-hmm. uh, when does this take place? Which Magog is coming back? This the the Kingdom Come Magog. I mean, we okay. have played we played fast and loose with this continuity over the last twenty years a little bit, yes. but 
you know, as the co-creator of Magog, I feel like I have some grounds by which to establish this is definitive. Right. Okay. Uh, oh man, that's, you know, it's so, it's so funny because it's tough. It's, it's heartbreaking because I think, I feel like Magog kind of like, you know, he, he changes by the end of Kingdom Come, I think. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah, he, he is a new man at that point. Like he he understands his misunderstanding of Superman. Finally, um, yes, yep. But now we're mm-hmm. suggesting that he was there, there's a deep resentment because he trained him and failed him. Yep. Oh, that's my right. God. <laughs> never, you know, I he never found him. I swear, he said, "I will find you," and he never found him. Yeah. Huh. Uh, so. Are you psyched to see the reaction to yeah. this? Oh, I cannot wait to see people's reaction to this. Yeah, it's going to be like Christmas morning early. Yes. Seriously. Yeah. No, I'm I'm excited to see it myself, man. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's okay. put that in there. Mark, I've been meaning to uh, do this forever. Such a pleasure talking to you. No, my pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, Anytime. Thank you so much for sitting with me, man. Yeah. yeah. Keep up the great work.